Hey guys, today we are talking about the Sony 16 to 50 mm f 3.5 to 5.6, the old ass kit lens which has been bundled with Sony crop body cameras since all the way back in 2012. But especially with the release of the new Sony ZV-E10, which includes this lens as its kit lens option, you might be wondering, is this worth buying? And nine years later, can this lens still have some useful life in 2021? Will this lens be like Leonardo DiCaprio and get better with age, or will it be more like John Travolta, spiraling into obscurity and potentially even Scientology? Well, hold on to your L. Ron Hubbard novels for now, because we're going to pass on to Future Dave for an overview. Everything we will cover is listed with timestamps down in the description along with related videos and you'll also find affiliate links there. If you click one and buy something to support the channel then I guarantee a 15% reduction in your chance of being attacked by dinosaurs. If you want to see even more sample footage after this review then you can check out my ZV-E10 versus A6400 comparison which uses the 16 to 50 across even more examples and situations to help you form your own judgment. Plus, if you enjoy this video, then like, subscribe, and let me know any questions or thoughts down in the comments. And with that said, let's get started with field of view. The lens has a moderate zoom range from 16 millimeters at the widest to 50 millimeters at the tightest, which after the 1.5 times crop factor is a full frame equivalent range of 24 millimeters to 75 millimeters. That 24 millimeter wide end works well for vlogging, which we will touch on more in our next section. Plus, it's nice for landscapes, architecture and general scene setting. The rest of the zoom range gives you access to the popular 35mm and 50mm looks on your way up to the tightest 75mm equivalent view. You will get slightly more background compression as you move up through that zoom range and we'll touch on that more later when we talk about bokeh but overall it is a good amount of versatility from something which is so small. The 16-50 to also provides motorized power zoom which is nice for convenience and friendly for video especially when it is paired with something like the ZV-E10 which has a zoom lever on the camera itself. But remember to compensate for for that variable aperture, either by using a setting the entire zoom range can manage like f5.6 or using modes like aperture priority mode or auto iso to keep exposure constant as you zoom. More on video modes like that in this video if you aren't familiar. So you get decent versatility and some motorized benefits but can you get steady shots across that whole focal range? Let's talk stabilization. The lens has built-in OSS, which stands for Optical Steady Shot or In-Lens Stabilization. This works pretty well for simple handheld shots like pans and tilts. Right now you're seeing a quick comparison of shots with and without in-lens stabilization turned on and I think you'll agree that when we use in-lens stabilization there is a pretty significant improvement. More broadly, in-lens stabilization results are pretty nice for those static shots. Stable enough to not make anyone seasick but retaining a nice organic handheld quality. However, if you try using in-lens stabilization for more complex movements like walking or vlogging, exactly as we are right now, then you're going to end up with results about as stable and steady as my stomach after a night of laxatives and curry. And I really don't recommend imagining that. But I do recommend considering other types of stabilization if you have them. For example, active steady shot, electronic stabilization, or catalyst browse, gyroscopic stabilization. And if you do, then the wide end of the lens becomes particularly important because both of those crop in to help you get smoother results in your footage. Right now you're looking at the ZV-E10 using active steady shot, which is typically a bit smoother than OSS from this lens, but at the price of wind giving you a terrible haircut. At the price of a substantial 43% crop into the image. There's more info on that in the detailed ZV-E10 review, but it's fair to say things are starting to look a little tight. Is there anything we can do? The answer is yes, and that is by using the previously mentioned Catalyst Brows, which is what you're seeing right now with a crop of 10%. Now, that does introduce an extra step in post-production, and the Catalyst Gyro feature is only really available on Sony cameras from 2020 onwards. However, if you've got the option and you don't mind the workflow, it can give you the best of both worlds with this lens. A nice wide view for vlogging, as well as smooth, slick stabilization. Now let's finish our stabilization discussion by showing you a quick walking test. We are comparing no stabilization, which just looks terrible, 
in lens stabilization, which marginally improves things, but clearly isn't meant for walking. Active steady shot, which takes off a lot of the edge and does an okay job. And catalyst stabilization, which makes such a difference, I think it proves Sony are actually wizards who are just claiming to be an electronics company. I always suspected, and something else I suspected, was that the bokeh this lens could achieve was not going to impress me. So, was I right? Well, perhaps not, actually. At the wider end of the zoom range, bokeh is modest. There's just enough blur to be noticeable and to give some satisfyingly subtle subject separation in a vlogging scenario. If you get closer or take advantage of the minimum focus distance of around 10.3 centimeters, then you can get pretty nice results. Nothing crazy, but smooth transitions between in and out of focus areas, pleasantly obscured backgrounds and attractive blur. Zoom in fully and the background compression achieved offsets the higher minimum aperture of f5.6 to give results that I found surprisingly pleasing, even if they are a bit understated compared to some of the really wide aperture crop lenses that you can get. And if you combine full zoom with the zoomed in minimum focal distance of around 22 centimeters, then you can get some pretty great results. This obviously won't be viable in some situations, but for B-roll, smaller subjects and extreme close-ups, you can bag some bemusingly bountiful bokeh. Bueno. While we are talking bees, let's cover bokeh balls. These are, again, nicer than I expected. Decently sized when zoomed in, and not bad even at wider angles. The seven-bladed circular aperture does a good job creating nice round balls, which are largely clean with minimal artifacts inside. Okay, so credit to the 16-50 to 50 for beating my expectations, but remember, some of those best results were only possible in shots which are quite situational, unlike our next topic autofocus, which is useful in pretty much every situation. And autofocus performance is actually pretty impressive here for a lens which is nearly old enough to be attending middle school in the USA. If you pair it with recent Sony cameras like the ZV-E10 or A6400, the tracking performance is excellent, as you can see on screen. And in typical situations with good light, I can't remember the 16 to 50 being anything other than fast and accurate. Rack focus works well in most situations too. It's perhaps not the best in class out of all the lenses I've tested, but it is consistent, it's effective, and I don't think you'll have much trouble getting good rack focus shots. But what about manual focus pulls? Well, manual focus on the lens is non-linear, which means the same movement of the focus ring does not guarantee the same amount of movement in focus planes. So, Accurate repeated focus pulls and shifts are tricky, but this is a problem which is common to most mirrorless camera lenses. The focus ring itself feels a little bit cheap compared to the wider build quality of the lens, but it works well enough and it doubles as a manual zoom control ring when your camera is set to autofocus mode. That is some efficient design and brings us nicely to our next section on price, design and build quality. The lens has a list price of £319, but in reality, you should only pay a tiny fraction of that. You'll find the lens much cheaper when it's bundled with a camera, or on its own from around £150 new, even less if you pick it up secondhand. It has a truly compact design, all the pancake goodness, but far fewer carbs. Dimensions are on screen right now, but the short version is that the lens collapses down to something compact enough to hold in a palm or a pocket, and it's not much bigger when it's turned on and fully extended. Before I regret using the phrase, it's not much bigger when turned on and fully extended, let's swiftly move on and discuss the front of the lens, where you will find a recessed 40.5 millimeter filter thread and sight of an aperture which ranges from a maximum of f3.5 at the wide end and f5.6 at the tight end through to f22 and f36 respectively. Construction and feel are largely decent quality with mostly metal and a little bit of plastic. The lens feels reassuringly solid despite how small and light it is, coming in at just 116 grams. It definitely isn't premium, but it feels nice enough, and the pertinently potent portability is a significant highlight, unlike our next topic, low light. I'll see myself out. 
The 16 to 50 is not a good choice for low light shooting. That maximum aperture of f3.5 to 5.6 is just too narrow to drink in enough light when conditions are dark. So you'll need to push up to a high ISO. You'll find my recent deep dive into low light and ISO performance of the ZV E10 and A6400 here. So you can see just how far you can push these Sony crop cameras. But the short version is that this lens often required me to push up to and above of ISO 6400, which leads to soft, mushy and sometimes unusable results. Autofocus is a bit better than I expected in low light and did a respectable job given the aperture limitations of the lens, but it still isn't reliable. You can get okay night shots with the 16 to 50, but like when I considered using a machete for my manscaping, it really is not the right tool for the job and things can very easily go badly wrong, so I don't recommend it. However, I do recommend you join me for a few concluding thoughts. So, is the 16 to 50 worth it? And should you be considering getting one? Well, I would say if you know the specific lenses that you intend to shoot with, perhaps not. You're probably better off taking your cash away from this jack of all trades and putting it towards an option which is at least the master of something. However, if you don't know where to start with interchangeable lenses and you'd like something with good versatility and great portability, while you also don't need luscious low light, stunning stabilization or ridiculous range, then the 16 to 50 is actually a pretty decent choice. And if you don't have unrealistic expectations, you may end up pretty happy with a lens which has pretty damn good autofocus, a solid amount of variety, and some really pleasing close focus bokeh. But what do you think? Let me know down in the comments. And since that brings us to the end for today, a massive thank you for watching, especially making it all the way to the end of the video. If you enjoyed it, then like, subscribe, check out the affiliate links in the description. But most importantly, until next time, take it easy.